Uh, Bible reading today is from the book of Ephesians, uh, chapter 15, sorry, chapter 5, verses 15 to 33. It reads as follows. Pay careful attention then to how you walk, not as unwise people, but as, as wise, making most of the time because the days are evil. So don't be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. And don't get drunk with wine, which leads to reckless living, but be filled by the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making music with your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for everything to God the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another in the fear of Christ. Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord, because the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church. He is the savior of the body. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives are to submit to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself to her to make her holy, cleansing her with the washing of water by the word. He did this to present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or anything like that, but holy and blameless. In the same way, husbands are to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hates his own flesh, but provides and cares for it, just as Christ does for the church. Since we are members, so, since we are members of his body, sorry. for this reason, a man will leave his mother and father and be joined to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This mystery is profound, but I am talking about Christ and the church. To sum up, each one of you is to love his wife as himself, and the wife is to respect her husband. Thank you, church. So we have spent the last few weeks in a series titled Real Talk. So Real Talk, according to the Urban Dictionary, is the philosophy of talking candidly, openly, and honestly, without fear of what others might think. Real talk is also used to let someone know of something that may be hard to speak about or something hard that is coming. As a church, sometimes we need some real talk to ask the hard questions and to resolve to finding practical biblical solutions that bring about real lasting change. As a church, we long to see transformation in the lives of our people. We long to see our people grappling with life and to flourish. Our title this morning is Destination Marriage. Is marriage the destination or the journey? Many cultures push and promote marriage as the final destination, as the final level of life. You may hear parents pushing kids out of the house with the idea of marriage and starting a new family. Some cultures see marriage as a way to find fulfillment, some to make you happy, this happiness comes in different forms, whether sexual fulfillment, cooking, cleaning, respect, and having children. Courageous is a movie about four fathers and husbands. As the movie starts, you see the focus on the normal phases of life. The four are skilled and dedicated at being policemen, but struggle as fathers and husbands. As the story progresses, one of the four faces tragedy and this, is, this causes the three to question their faith and effectiveness in their roles as father and husbands. The men's belief in marriage is rooted in their Christian faith. They understand that marriage is a sacred covenant and that their role as husbands is to love and lead their families in a God-honoring way. They seek guidance from their local church and commit to following biblical principles in their relationships. They also realize that their influence as, as fathers extends beyond their immediate families and has a lasting impact on their community. The film emphasizes the transformative power of faith and the importance of taking responsibility for one's role within the family. So this morning as we grapple with Ephesians, we will see the true picture of marriage. We will understand that marriage is a journey and not a destination. We will see that the journey isn't one that is taken alone we will see that there are roles in marriage which not only reflect our marriage, but the picture of marriage as Christ and the church. So our map for this morning, three points, and then we will be out of here. Submit to one another, that's the first point. Journey versus destination. 
and then husband and wife as the last point. So we're in Ephesians 5 this morning. I'm not going to spend a lot of time looking at the overview because we want to spend as much time as possible speaking and grappling with marriage. I'm also not trying to create a new record in length of sermon. So, so an easy way to remember and understand the book of Ephesians is to think of it in two volumes or two parts of one story. So the first part, which is the first three chapters, is the gospel. Gospel meaning good news. So the first three chapters are the good news about God who makes alive dead people through faith in Christ because of his mercy. So the first three chapters are the good news about God who makes alive dead people through faith in Christ because of his mercy. So people have their identity as dead because of sin which entered the world through Adam. We are destined to face the wrath of God for our sins and separation from God. Ephesians 2 verse 4 to 5 reads, But God who is rich in mercy because of his great love that he had for us made us alive with Christ even though we were dead in trespasses. So because of Christ we have a new identity. We are alive because of faith in Christ. Ephesians 2 verse 8 to 9 reads as follows. For you are saved by grace through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is God's gift, not from work so that, so that no one can boast, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared ahead of time for us to do. The second half of Ephesians is the last three chapters. And this is the practical implications of this new identity. So Ephesians, 1, Ephesians 4 verse 1 starts as follows. The be- and this is the beginning of the second half of the book. Therefore, I, the prisoner in the Lord, urge you to walk worthy of the calling you received with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Therefore means for the reason you have new identity in Christ, because he has made you alive, live like you have been made alive. Be humble, gentle, and patient. Bear with one another in love. You have been loved yourself and be united. So the unity is because of this new identity that is not from ourselves, that is a gift from God so we cannot boast or be proud. So our lives should look different because of the sanctification that comes from the gospel. This morning we want to look at marriage, how marriage should be different because of the gospel. So let's look at our first point. Submit to one another. So Ephesians 5, 22 to 33 is a well-known passage. It is used for wedding sermons, used for teaching about marriage at conferences and maybe even Bible studies. If you think about how the original letter of Ephesians was received in Ephesus and written by Paul, the letter would have been one whole letter without the verse numbers and section headings. So, that, that, so the verses that come before verse 22, which is our feature passage, are as important as, as the first three chapters as well, as this was one whole letter received and read as a single letter to the audience. So the beginning of chapter 5 speaks about the people with a new identity, those who are saved because of faith in Christ. And they should be imitators of God, to be those who live in the light. So let's pick it up in verse 15, as Kulisa read for us. So pay careful attention then to how you walk, not as unwise people, but as wise, making the most of the time, because the days are evil. So don't be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. And don't get drunk with wine, which leads to reckless living. But be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Singing and making music with your heart to the Lord. Giving thanks always for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Submitting to one another in the fear of Christ. It is as if Paul was writing in 2023. Let's be real, fam. Knowing that... We don't always make the most use of time. We don't always pay careful attention to how we live. It is like Paul was at Ridgebacks or Chesanyama or the church on a Sunday morning when some may be drunk, not full of the Holy Spirit, but full of black label Savannah or Smirnoff, living recklessly. It is like Paul was there on a Monday morning when we consider it a slow day and hide behind the routine of life. But Paul is giving a warning that we should be wise. 
that we should make use of the time and the warning is because the days are evil. The wrath of God is coming and we should live in the light. So verse 21 is a key verse as we consider Ephesians 5 verse 15 to 33. It is the foundation of what comes after. Verse 21 says, submitting to one another in fear of Christ. Paul here is helping to frame how we should live. All believers should submit to one another. The Greek word used here is a military word, which when explained means to put yourself under the rank of someone else, to think of yourself lower, to view and value others more than yourself. It means taking on the mindset of a servant. So we ought to seek out the best interests of others. We ought to serve others. This is how we should live. This is what Paul says. Just a quick side road. Submitting to one another does not mean being passive. Does not, being, does not mean being a doormat or compromising your faith. Being submissive does not mean weakness. Submitting to one another does not mean that there is no authority or leadership. As elders, myself and Reino submit to the church. We take care of God's purse and we account for that. We are open about that. We take care of God's people and we account for that. And we account for that to you, the people of the church. So we submit to you. As elders, we have a God-given leadership role, meaning if you call Fellowship City home, then you submit to the elders and the leadership of the church. So submitting to one another does not mean that there's no leadership or authority. Submitting to one another does mean adopting a servant lifestyle as we follow the example of Christ. In order to adopt a servant lifestyle, in order to submit to one another, we need to be growing in godliness. So just as we read Ephesians uh, 4 verse 1 uh, we need to be growing with all, we need to be, all, we need to be with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. So we can't submit to one another if we're not submitting first to God, if we aren't first living in the light, if we aren't being transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit, if we aren't growing as believers. It also means being at peace. If we're growing in humility, gentleness, patience, and bearing with one another in love, if we are unified by the Spirit through the bond of peace, then we are at peace submitting to one another in love. So real talk. This means if you're not at peace, if you are passive or fighting, egocentric, then there's a gospel problem. There's a lack of focus on the cross of Christ and the good news as we've seen or as we know from chapters 1 to 3 of Ephesians. This is the same in marriage. If you're not submitting to one another in the fear of Christ, if you're not putting the interest of the other before yourself, if you're not considering your spouse more than you consider yourself, then for sure there will be trouble. This conflict has its roots in idolatry, selfishness, and self seltedness which is the darkness that Paul speaks about in Ephesians 5. It comes from the opposite of what Paul says in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1 to 3. It says that there's no humility, there's no gentleness, there's no patience, there's no bearing with one another in love, and there's no unity. If we are growing in unity, gentleness, patience, peace, and, and bearing with one another in love, if we're growing as followers of Jesus, if we're rooted in the good news, which is being made alive from a point of deadness, from a point of darkness, because of Christ, then we will then we will be more like Christ if we submit to one another in fear of Christ. Let's look at our second point. Journey versus destination. In order to have a flourishing marriage, we need to understand what marriage is. A blueprint is a design or it's a technical plan. It's a guide for making something we need uh, is a design for making something. Um, we, we need to find the blueprint. We need to find the map or key in order to understand what marriage is. It is like the can of Coke. While using it, you might not understand why the opener has a hole on it. But it has a purpose. It is to hold the straw in place as you use it. Or the oven, the bottom drawer of an oven. It looks optimal for storing trays but it's actually a warmer to warm food. 
That was the intention of why it was created. So if we don't, if, if we want to understand marriage, then we ought to start with finding the purpose and understanding what marriage is supposed to be. We need to find the blueprint. So let's build out this blueprint from the Word of God. The greatest and most important thing in marriage is to understand that your marriage is not your own. It is not primarily to make yourself happy, not primarily to meet your needs. It is a journey, not a destination. God's purpose in the life of every believer, whether married or single, is spiritual transformation. It is more of Christ than less of us. The life of a believer has the Holy Spirit sanctifying the believer, setting the believer apart for God and creating an individual who's continuously conforming to the likeness of Christ, to the image of Christ. That is the purpose in the life of every believer. God's purpose in marriage is to make us more holy, not necessarily happy. I'm saying not necessarily because if we are more holy, then we're more likely to be happy. But happiness is, is, is it itself is not the chief end of marriage. This is why marriage is not a destination, like society portrays it to be. It's not the final level of life. It's not what you necessarily need when you turn 18. It is not what will fulfill you like what culture says. If we don't understand this, then marriage will be hard. For your spouse is not as perfect as you want them to be. Either they don't cook well enough or maybe don't want to cook either way. Either they don't change all the broken lights or keep the car working well enough. Either they don't cherish you but seem to cherish their work or friends more. There are two sinful people coming together with their own past, with their own baggage, ideas, and desire. God does redeem our baggage, does redeem our hurt and unmet expectations, but our posture needs to be correct. We need to understand that marriage is about Christ and the church. Husband and wife, a union that is the church. The right posture and attitude in marriage is to submit to one another. It is mutual submission. It is to outdo one another in love and service. Marriage is a journey and not a destination, a journey to being more like Christ as your marriage portrays a picture of Christ and the church. We see this in Ephesians 5 verse 31. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This mystery is profound, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. To sum up, each one of you is to love his wife as himself, and the wife is to respect her husband. So marriage is more than a man and woman coming together. It's about Christ and the church. Here's a quote from John and Noel Piper. Marriage is meant by God to put that gospel reality on display in the world. That is why we are married. That is why all married people are married, even when they don't know and embrace this gospel. The first marriage we see is in Genesis 2 verse 18. Then the Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper corresponding to him. A few verses on, verse 21. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to come over the man and he slept. God took one of his ribs and closed the flesh at that place. Then the Lord God made the rib he had taken from the man into a woman and brought her to the man. And the man said, this one at last is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. This one will be called woman, for she was taken from man. This is why a man leaves his father and mother and bonds with his wife and they become one flesh. This is the first marriage. We have the man waiting for his wife to be. The wife to be is brought by the father, verse 22. God brings Eve to Adam. Does this sound familiar as a wedding practice? They then are one. Paul mentions a profound mystery in verse 32. He is referring to marriage, the union of a man and woman being like Christ and the church, the union of man and woman with God. God is at the center of marriage. 
if we miss this, then we miss the very essence of marriage and we pervert marriage to what we want it to be. So let's focus on what Paul has to say to husbands and wives for a moment. Let's start with wives. Submit is a key word in what Paul says to wives. And as I say that, I know that some wives will be looking directly at me. Paul says to wives, even though there's mutual submission, wives still need to submit to their husbands as to the Lord. Wives need to submit because the husband is the head and submit as an extension of the metaphor of Christ and the church. So there's three ways in which wives need to submit, which we see in the beginning of that verse. Wives need to submit to their husbands, and they need to submit, uh, submit to their husbands as to the Lord, and they need to submit because the husband is the head, and they need to submit as an extension of the metaphor of Christ and the church. Here's something to reflect on. Christ submitted to us, even being God, he submitted to the plan of the Father to die a shameful death on a cross to redeem us to God the Father. So wives are called to submit to their husbands as they submit to the Lord. The submission is an order as they submit to the Lord. It's the order that God has purposed. Satan purposefully tempts Eve in Genesis. He does so by making Eve believe she will be like God. But Eve was more like God when she was in submission or subject to Adam because this is God's original design. And this reflects God's image. So God's original design includes the husband as head. This is a divine part of God's plan. We may fail as men to be head or take on the headship role, but it does not take away the role we should be playing. Headship simply is the calling of a husband to take responsibility and accountability for Christ, like leadership in the home. So the role of the wife is the metaphor of Christ and the church is playing the role, uh, the role, the role of the wife in the metaphor of Christ and the church is playing the role of the church. She's to submit to the husband who's playing the role of Christ in the metaphor of Christ and the church. So let's be practical and let's be real. So wife, real talk. You may be more competent, you may be more intelligent, you may bring more money home, But submission is an act of putting down your desire to lead and enabling your husband to lead. This is hard. To To the wife, if you don't submit to your husband, if you wrestle headship and leadership, he may lead somewhere else rather than where he should be leading. He might lead at work because he has the room to lead. He might lead his friends because they don't wrestle that leadership away from him. Here's some advice. Don't make him feel unworthy to lead. Here's truth that some wives need to hear this morning. The headship role is under attack by the devil. His greatest weapon is to whisper to your husband that he's a failure, that he's not worthy, that he's a little boy, and here's some homework for you wives. Ask your husband about the relationship that he has with his dad. This is what I believe you will hear as you ask that question. I was not good enough. I was not seen. I was always making mistakes. I was never loved. I was not known. Or I didn't have a father. If by your behavior, by your words, by your thoughts, you wrestle leadership from your husband, then this perpetuates the cycle of lost identity and perverted role. What many women say to this is that we must not make excuses for men. We must not give men a pass. Just remember this. You are likely the loudest voice in your husband's ear and mind. Think about the sentiments and the nuances that he hears often from you. Sometimes we may say we shouldn't give men a pass or make excuses, but we tear 
them down. We belittle them. Wives, how have you edified your husband in his role as leader? How have you encouraged his leadership in the home? How have you invested in his education, in his role as leader of the home? I'll come back to this part of this question about leadership. Just a quick side road. Submission does not mean that all the big decisions are made by men. It does not mean that men are the boss. Husbands are fallible. They make mistakes and they are human. A decision may look unwise to the wife. It may look like the wrong thing to do. But the wrong thing to do is to keep quiet or to wait for the decision to blow back and then criticize him. Here's something to consider. Let him know that you hear his heart and his intention with the decision, but ask to speak more about it. Say that it worries you. But you have to speak in a way that also affirms his role as leader. Husbands ought to also consider their wives more than themselves. Consider if the decisions they make are building up the family, if they are God-honoring, if their family is excited and edified by those decisions, and if their wife is discerning of the same decisions that you want to make. Husbands, it's your turn. We did not purposefully have our ladies away at the getaway when we wanted to speak about marriage. It just so happened. But then it means that we have some time to speak to men specifically. I know many of you have probably been agree agreeing and happy to hear about the wife's role in marriage, but it's your turn. So let's listen. Wife, please don't check out. This is really important for you also, and you will see why. Love and body is a repeated theme for you. Love and body is a repeated theme. I'm going to start with the body and work my way back to love. Verse, 20, verse 28, husbands are to love their wives as their own bodies. How do we love our bodies? I know many guys who get stuck here. What does it mean that we should love our own bodies? I know many guys who get stuck at, am I loving my body? Verse, 20, verse 29, for no one ever hates his own flesh, but provides and cares for it, just as Christ does for the church, since we are members of his body. We are all members of Christ's body. The doctrine of Christ's body says that we are all connected to the body. The ESV in verse 29 says that we are nourished and cherished as we are connected to this body. How are we nourished? As believers, we're nourished by Christ through his word. This is the same picture we should see here. We love our bodies if we're nourishing and cherishing our bodies. I'm not talking about a mani and pedi. I'm not talking about a clean shave or a six pack or all the other variations of packs. I'm primarily talking about the word of God. Think about the car. If the outside is shiny, sparkly, but the inside is rusted, is a rusted engine, then the car isn't fit for purpose. Men, we need to be more worried about the engine than the shiny outside. We need to saturate and nourish ourselves with the word of God. It needs to flow in and through us. How can we tell if we are nourishing our, our bodies? I can tell you for free that if you are reading your Bible once on a Sunday when we hear Kuliso reading it for us, then you're not nourishing your body. If you're spending time reading all the biographies of other people and not the Bible which speaks about Jesus, then you're not nourishing your body. If you spend more time playing games, scrolling social media, reading news, watching movies and series, then you're not nourishing your body. I'm not saying that all these things are bad. I'm just saying they show where our priorities are. If you can tell me what the score of the All Blacks versus Springboks is, 
but can't tell me how many times love is repeated in this section of Ephesians or can't tell me what the blueprint of marriage is, then you're not nourishing your body. How many times have you sat and read your Bible in the last week? I'm not talking about the fortune cookie passage that pops up on your notifications from you version. How many sermons have you listened to in this last week? Do you know that they will run out if you listen to four or more a week? Are you meeting with other men and reading the Bible together? How often have you done that this year? You cannot love your wives if you don't love your body. You cannot submit to one another in fear of the Lord if you're not constantly washed and nourished by the word of God. Paul is saying that you are one flesh with your wife. If you don't love your wife, then I know that you don't love your body and you have missed the message about the cross and have missed the good news. This is for you to hear as well, wives. The way your husband loves you is directly proportional to his love of himself and how he nourishes himself. No husband is going to walk near me after the service. Don't worry, I wouldn't either. So love is a big word, so let's go to, let's go to love. So let me simplify it for my brothers. The Greek word used here is agape. So let me start with a couple of words, or a couple of Greek words, that is not what is meant here. Eros is a sexual passion. Eros is a Greek word that means sexual passion. So Paul isn't saying you must have sexual passion for your wife. It is good for you to have sexual passion for your wife. It is good for you to have sexual passion for her, but it isn't primarily the love that you should show or have for your wife. Philia is another Greek word which explains another type of love. This means affection or more like friendship. This is good, but it's not the kind of love spoken about here by Paul. There are seven other Greek words for love, and I don't think any of them fit because the word used here is agape love, which means something specific. So you're welcome to research those words later on. The word used here, the Greek word used here is agape love. This is a deeper love. It is a selfless love. It is an unconditional love. Paul is saying unconditionally, selflessly love your wife. It's important to note here that Paul doesn't say if she submits. I want to tell you men that you love your wife even if she doesn't submit. Even if she, even if she breaks you down. Even if she doesn't cook, does not clean. You love your wife even if she questions your authority. Even if she earns more than you and withholds money. You love her even if she isn't sexually appealing at the moment. Even if she's not friendly as we consider eros or filial love. You love her unconditionally. That's what Paul is saying here. So how do you love your wife? Real talk. Let me tell you first how not to love your wife. Not loving your wife is shouting at your wife. Is ignoring your wife. Spending the whole day with your friends or recreation of your choice if you have not considered or spent any time with your wife. It's leaving the house without telling your wife like a thief not taking an interest in the things that interest her. It's not knowing what interests her in this season. It is not nourishing your wife with the word of God. Making excuses to not be intimate with your wife. It is making sex about you and your enjoyment and not about serving your wife. Not resolving conflict with your wife. Conflict is good. We should learn how to handle conflict like adults. How to talk to each other with respect and hearing one another. 
blaming your wife when you are passive and don't want to lead. Comparing your wife to other women, either to her or even to your friends. Those are all examples of how not to love your wife. Don't do that, man. Even as you consider that last point, consider the friends and the people that you keep near you. Are they building you up? Or are they causing you more and more to not love your wife? Here are some ways to love your wife. If you answer yes to, any, to all of these, then you're loving your wife. Do you love her by nourishing her and caring for her? Do you know how her walk with Jesus is going? Do you know how many times she read, she read the Bible this week? Again, not fortune cookie, but really spending time reading and reflecting on the Word of God. Do you know if she's meeting with other women and being edified and encouraged? Do you know her struggles at work? Do you listen to her? Do you support her? Does she feel seen and appreciated? Are you hanging around men that bash or speak ill of, of, of their wives? Or are, are you hanging around men who love and cherish their wives? Lastly, can your wife affirm any of the yeses you gave yourself? Here's a couple more. Being a man of God is how we love our wives. Seeking God. Building yourself up in Christ. Reading the Bible more than on a Sunday morning, but engaging the Bible. Letting the Bible transform you in and out. Being a man after God's own heart. Being a man of God is how we love our wives. Encourage her gifts. Do you know her gifts? She's talented, she's gifted, so encourage her to use her gifts. Create spaces for her to use her gifts. Respect her opinion. She has an opinion. Find out how she feels. Share your heart with her and seek her heart. Speak kindly to her and use your words with wisdom. Your words can build or destroy. Choose wisely. Treat her with respect. She isn't your servant. She may want to serve you, but treat her with respect. Pray for your home, for your kids, and for her. Lead in your home. It's not a responsibility to cook, to clean, to do homework, shop for the house. It's your responsibility. Help her do these things if she wants to honor you and do these things. Edify her and build her up as she does, these, as she does those things. Do it with him. Do it for your family. Be the leader of your home and love your wife. As we close, the quote we read from John and Noel Piper puts it in context that marriage is from God, whether you know it or not. Marriage is about Christ and the church, whether you are a believer or not, because marriage is from God. As believers, we have the blueprint to marriage. We have the cheat code. We have the map because we know the author of marriage. What we need to remember is that submitting to one another is the basis and the lens we ought to view life and marriage. To do this, we need to be transformed continuously by the gospel, by the word of God. The only way for the gospel to transform us is by reading the Bible regularly, consuming it, and being consumed by the word of God. If gym is your, your favorite pastime and you do it five times a week, why not put a sermon in your ears while doing that? That doesn't substitute the need to read the Bible, but it enhances how often you engage in the Word of God. If you're riding the train every day or driving to work, why not listen to a sermon while going to work? If you go for fish, why not listen to a sermon at the driving range or as you sit in the boat fishing? Men, you need to be meeting with other men. Not men who, are pushing, men who are pushing you to be after God's own heart. Men who want to see you flourish. Men that want to encourage you and that can encourage you and rebuke you. 
Why not read the Bible with them? Why not tell them what you're reading so that you're accountable to someone? I know that this is hard, man. But the cheat code is there. Being consumed by the word of God, being transformed by the word of God regularly enables us to play that headship role well within the space of marriage. I want us to pray now for our marriages, that our marriages would bring God glory, that the world would see Christ and the church. If you are married and you're seeking help in your marriage, then come to speak to me after the service. There are several ways in which we can help and which we do help married folk. Because as, as elders, we seek to see marriages within our church flourish. We seek to see the picture of Christ in the church seen by the world. We desire to see marriages thrive. We desire to see people on the journey of marriage, loving one another and submitting to one another in love and playing within their roles as husband and wife. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that you hold the blueprint, you hold the keys, the map to marriage. And we thank you that we can learn about what marriage is and what you've created marriage to be, a picture of Christ and the church as we engage your word. I pray that this morning that you would stir in our hearts the desire to know you more, the desire to be transformed by the work of your Holy Spirit, to be more and more like Christ. I pray that you would stir up that desire that we want to know you more. And I pray that that, that, that desire will, will mean that we we seek and desire and love to submit to one another out of fear for you. That we consider others more than we consider ourselves. That we put others first. We seek to serve and love others as we follow the example of Christ. We pray that that may spill over in our marriages. That we would seek to love and serve one another. I pray for husbands and, and wives and I pray for the roles that you've created and, and ordered within the marriage space. I pray where there needs to be healing that you would heal, that you would restore. I pray where there needs to be encouragement that you would encourage and build up. I pray where there's fear and anxiety that you may bring comfort. I pray that you would draw us nearer to yourself so that our relationship with you is continuously making us transform and be more and more like Christ so that we can have a greater and better relationship with our spouse. I pray that you enable wives to submit as to the Lord, to submit to the husband as the head of the home, and to submit as a picture of Christ and the church. I pray that you enable husbands to love their wives as they love their body. I pray that husbands would nourish their bodies and seek to care for their bodies and seek to care and nourish their wives. I pray that husbands would love their wives. I pray for those that are maybe in spaces where they're feeling discouraged, hurt and confused, that they may seek help, and as they seek help, that we'll be able to help and point them to the cross of Christ and build up the marriages within our church and the world at large so that the world may see Christ and the church. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.